because I've been thinking a lot about philosophy and art, and I by no means am an expert on philosophy. Um, I'm pretty seasoned in art and being an artist and creating art commercially. And uh, I think there is something to be said for philosophy helping with art. So we're gonna get into that. Okay, so I've been listening to a lot of um, like debates and streams and interesting conversations about different philosophical concepts. And, and I'm, the problem is I'm like really terrible with people's names. Um, so you'd have to look at my last live stream to know <coughs> to, to know the name of this philosopher. But I was watching a, um, <coughs> he's kind of a philosopher and also a, a physicist um, who, uh, who kind of has come up with this interesting breakdown of language and analogy and basically is talking about the idea that like things that we take for granted that are like embedded concepts in our minds um, that have become kind of programmed in our minds so that we don't have to follow like a whole thought chain to build a very complicated word that has a lot of complicated meaning. Um, if you unpack the complicated word or the complicated idea, it really boils down to a lot of simple um, ideas that are interwoven to make meaning. And it's, it's a really cool idea. Um, it's a very like easy to digest idea in the way that he presented it. And it got me thinking, that's so, so analogous to art. Um, the, the process of making art, like when you, when you look at a really brilliant painting, um, you know, the way it's executed can be like really overwhelming quite a lot. Or if you look at a really good artist who's just drawing incredibly like off the top of their head, it can make you feel overwhelmed because you look at the result, you look at the idea, you look at the packed um, execution of something very complicated and it, it can look overwhelming or it can almost look like a, a magic trick really well performed. But anybody who's done magic tricks, right, will know that like a magic trick is a lot of really simple components combined, um, you know, with sleight of hand to blow your mind and look like a miracle, right? Even though in reality, it's usually a trick full of a lot of um, really interwoven components that give you the illusion of something impossible occurring. Um, okay, so we do that all the time as storytellers. Um, and and I was thinking about the ability, uh, Corey Kerr just recently did a video about this too. Um, but the superpower that artists have um, that, uh, that can differentiate them commercially in a field as well as in their own personal work. It can uh, differentiate your work and give it a unique voice. Um, and that is the ability to look at a complicated package. Uh, wait a minute, I'm jumping too far ahead. Let me explain what, what at least this philosophy, uh, he had a word for this package, but I'm just gonna call it a package. What he had called this idea, um, it, it, it basically, it neurally embeds, this is how we learn, is, is like by embedding little ideas and then seeing similarities, grouping them, and then from that complicated group, we have one idea that forms as like, a, you know, once there's a neural network, right? Like, so we create a neural network of all these interesting contrasting ideas or, or similar ideas and all of those little points like you know it can be something simple like learning what dirt is right and then learning what sand is and then learning what rocks are and learning what boulders are and learning what mountains are and they're all kind of in a similar family of ideas like they're they're similar but analogous
analogous things. Like they're they're like you know in in color theory, analogous is like colors that are right next to your main color on the color wheel. So you have like your primary colors, and there's analogous colors right next to like you know blue, um, and right next to you know all the colors on the on the spectrum. Um, it, analogous thoughts are kind of similar, where they're like. They're next door neighbors, like they're very close to each other, but they're not um, not the same. And so our minds as human beings are really good, and, and this is what was interesting about like the the um, the uh, you know the the guy who was lecturing on this because he's all he also does a lot of neuroscience, and it's like he was talking about how our minds embed and learn an idea. And what we do is take those complicated ideas, like those little, they're not complicated, they're simple, but we combine all of these little simple things into one big group. And that big group forms an idea that's much more complicated and becomes part of a bigger neural network. So you're building all these little sub ideas that kind of branch out from, you know, they all branch to one big concept. And then that big concept becomes part of another network that like branches to a big concept. It's almost like a pyramid scheme of ideas, right, in the brain. And so it's really interesting where it's like, you know, you have your big, crazy, complicated thing, and then it can be broken down into simple things. And it reminds me of like the structure of an essay. Um, the structure of an essay or a compelling argument is really pretty simple where you make a claim, right? I mean, I'm just saying it, it's like core. Uh, and this thing got me through grad school, this little uh, cheat for making really good essays, where you're gonna do a thesis, right? You want three supporting facts, and then you want a conclusion that ties the supporting facts as as um, scaffolding, like the, or scaffolding is the wrong word. They're like the structure, the underlying structure, the legs of the argument are your thesis, that's what's holding up your idea, your claim at the beginning. And a good thesis is usually gonna have a very clear claim. So you're making a clear, concise claim about something, and then you're supporting it with ideas, and not just ideas like of your fancy, but factual ideas, or historical ideas, or scientific ideas, um, or observable truths, whatever it is, and then your conclusion ties all of it together, wraps it with a bow, and repeats your thesis. So basically, your, your thesis is like your general claim. Your conclusion is gonna be repeating your claim, but now showing how all of these stilts that you've kind of put your thesis on really are supporting your thesis and then debate is the process of just kind of like you know it's, it's very similar to essay building where it's just the process of like a bunch of people trying to knock out those stilts because if you can knock out the stilts the supporting facts if you can prove they're not factual if you can take out those little supports then what happens to the guy on stilts they just fall right because they have nothing to hold them up so I've been thinking about this and art and uh, this superpower that we have um, that ties into this concept. Um, a superpower, like the, the process of philosophy, and this guy was kind of talking about it, but thinking about it, the process of philosophy is taking a complicated question that maybe at, at, at its on its face seems really simple. Like um, one of the most famous philosophical statements ever made was Descartes, right? Um, I think, therefore I am. That came from, like, what is thinking and what is being? Like, being, like, what does that even mean? Can I even trust my thinking about my being? And what is the resolution for that? And that kind of led to this whole thought chain and like a, a whole process of philosophy that resulted in, you know, the trope statement, I think, therefore I am, which actually was a really big move in philosophy because it allowed it to get out of the mire 
of the whole question of, um, you know, the brain in the vat or the, the man in the cave, uh, whether, whether we can trust our own thoughts and intuitions about reality. And the idea that like, you kind of have to use that as like a starting point to kind of build any logic from, because there's a point where questioning everything can become just this eternal um, question that never has an answer and it doesn't create anything productive for your life. And in philosophy, you know, uh, practical science is also helpful. Practical humanities are really important, right? What good is a brilliant novel that's unwritten? What good is a philosophy that doesn't actually help you in life? Um, and what good is you know, a scientific breakthrough if it doesn't lead to some sort of societal benefit, right? Like, why why would we want to know something if we're not going to do something cool with that thing? So anyhow, I'm going on a tangent here, <laughs> but there is a purpose to this whole chain. So what I've been thinking about is the ability to kind of like analyze a really complicated piece of art that maybe on its face looks simple. Break it down so the package, and I've been talking about packages this whole time, the package, which is that collection of all of those little tiny simple data points, right? Lower level thinking, but just in a massive quantity, all grouped together in a web to create a more complicated idea. Somewhat like mathematics, right? Mathematics starts with like basics. And the basics of mathematics are so fundamental to the bigger, crazier concepts, right? It all builds out from like a very simple thing. So how is this helpful for art? Well, first off, like artists, I think, should be engaging in reading and checking out philosophy. It's gonna help you in life. It's gonna help you learn how to think. And it's gonna help you with this process that, that Corey Kerr recently did a video on. And I think he did a better job than I've seen a lot of people do on this topic. Uh, there is a superpower for a graphic designer or an illustrator to be able to be sent 10 images from a client that they really liked, um, a visual kind of tapestry, and be able to like synthesize what it is about those images that's speaking to the client and be able to replicate that. And I don't mean to be able to copy a style, but more to like dissect a style and see what it is in that style that you can glean and use for your own work. And Corey visually shows this in his video. It's really cool. I wish off the top of my head I could remember the name of the video, but it's his, it's his latest video. Um, but what, what Corey does is he'll show like a, um, a, you know, a very old um, like lithograph with crazy just, you know, insane like textural detail. And then he'll zoom in on how they execute. I, I, you know, this is an example. I don't know if he actually did a hand, but I'll just use that as an example. Instead of looking at the whole and getting overwhelmed by it, what he does is analytically break down what is this person doing with line to show form on the hand, right? And then you can pull that, that one point from that artist and apply it to your own work and create your own kind of package of these little, simple, complicated ideas. The ability to do that is not super common in, in art. And I can say this, at least from my experience as an art director, and it's invaluable when somebody's able to do it because what you're doing is learning a language and, and, and learning a language uh, would be useless if you just dive in the deep end and are just hearing somebody speak a different language that you have no idea of the basics, like the little data points, and you're just hearing the package of their language just forced on you. Um, and, and again, like anytime we're faced with the package, it's very overwhelming. But when you take the package, unpack it, and see all the webs of like little data points, or when you take a style, like a visual style, and you break it down into all of the simple components that were combined 
to make a great effect. Um, you start learning the whole craft of art. And not just that, you start learning the art of conceptualizing. And you start understanding why things like uh, doing like a word chain, <clears throat> where you just, I, I've talked about this on, um, on my videos before, but you, you start to understand why like things like taking um, an idea, like when, you, you know, if you're stumped for ideas or you're trying to conceptualize a really good concept, um, you, you need to kind of allow your mind to sort of follow threads of ideas. And, uh, you know, this philosopher that I've been listening to recently would call it analogies. You need to allow your mind to kind of create analogies between things and kind of follow those analogies see where they go um now what's great about that is you can start with anything i'm driving i've used uh i think the last time i did this i drove past a trash can but i'm driving looking at a car right cars how did cars come to be <clears throat> cars were kind of like uh created with the engine and with wheels and like basically taking a lot of the innovation that, um, by the way, I'm really reducing this to way more simplicity than it can be yet. But uh, cars, you know, like are basically adding the motor engine, which was developed mostly for manufacturing and for um, agriculture, right? And taking this idea of a motor engine and adding it to all the innovations before that have been used for the horse and buggy, right? So you have like a, a, a literal, um, horse and buggy, you take out the horse and you put an engine in. And then I'm like thinking, okay, I just follow that thread. And I'm like, that's why they call the power in an engine, the horse power, right? Because it's literally, it is the horse driving the carriage. And we still use terms like this in a car. There is a carriage in a car, right? There's a lot of the components of a car outside of the electronics or the engine parts are just a carriage, like a really cool carriage that's been adapted and modified for safety and for speed and for aerodynamic movement uh, and for style, right? It's been designed, but like all designs, if I just look at a car, it's kind of overwhelming, right? If I break it down into its components or allow my mind to go through the analogy process, it starts generating ideas and it starts kind of creating this creative environment where you can start thinking a little bit beyond um, the literal, like beyond the first take. Um, and this is so valuable. So, so the kind of thing I'm talking about is the ability to take a car, <laughs> blow it up, not actually blow it up, but, you know, explode it like an exploded view, and look at all the components, and think about the components, and tie in the history of it, and all of this stuff, is an analytical approach to life, and it's an analytical way to learn, and as an artist, when you're looking at art, it's so important to do the exploded view, where you're saying, why does the line, um, make this effect like I'm looking at this image this thing with just using line looks really dimensional what are they doing with line right to make it look dimensional or this image is working really well because of the shapes what are they doing with shape that's working really well um, and then you start breaking down those shapes like they're going to be really complicated shapes at first by the way this is a big trick to drawing too you look at a landscape and it's overwhelming but then you start breaking it down into bigger shapes start big again start with the package right what is the package of this image composed of let's go down one step it's composed of mountains, of a stream, of um, trees, of a cottage. We'll, we'll just break down a Thomas Kincaid, my least favorite artist on the planet. <laughs> um, so just like for subject, like I'm looking at the subject of it and then breaking that down into shapes and then breaking those shapes down into other shapes 
Um, but when I'm looking at the big shapes, what I'm thinking is like, what might be appealing about this image if it's an image that has an interesting shape about it um, is you're gonna start noticing that like triangles look really good next to circular objects in a certain way and look very cramped and awkward if you move a circle closer to a triangle in a certain direction. Whereas if you pull it a little bit further away and leave a certain amount of space, it starts to have what we call like gestalt or balance. But then like, again, if you talk to, uh, if you're a young artist and somebody starts talking to you about balance, gestalt, movement, right? These ideas are packages. Um, and they are not some snobby, above your comprehension idea. They're an idea that's a package that's very complicated and can be very like snobby and hard to comprehend. But when you take the package, you break it down into simple points, um, you can learn the same concepts. And similarly with art, stylistically, same thing. There's hardly any style or, or, or a kind of art that is going to be so good that you couldn't at least on a craft level get to a similar point. And a lot of how you get there is by analytically looking at it, taking the package and breaking it down into simple, the simple ideas, the, taking the high level art and then breaking it down into the low level that all the little low level data points that combine to make, you know, synaptic connections or, or uh, neural networks, right? So I, I'm just throwing that out there. It's, it's some food for thought. And I love the idea. Um, one, of the, one of my favorite things about life in general <laughs> and, and getting older, um, it, there's all sorts of things that are tough about getting older, um, you know, but one of the things I love about it is starting to make these packages. Like I have so many packages that I've built in my brain uh, as an artist, different stylistic techniques, different vocabularies. And so it starts becoming a language, right? Where I'm, I'm starting, like most people start with a language where it's like, you know, I'm learning how to say hello and I'm learning, I'm learning how to ask where the bathroom is and how to order food. Basic things, right? Basic low level parts of that language. You can't get to the crazy sophisticated stuff in language until you start understanding those basic components and the complexities within those little simple low level ideas. Um, then you can build up and, and you can build up to uh, incredible results. So how does this apply realistically to art? This idea is the big secret between to, to artists who are able to adapt and grow and innovate um, and learn from artists before them. Um, this is one of the biggest meanings between, you know, good artists borrow, great artists steal. That's what that phrase is about. It's not about just like jacking somebody's art. It's about look at the big package and then look at the little components that are combining to make something that aesthetically spoke to you. And then when you see the little components, you've broken it down, then you can use parts, grab some of those components and use them in your own art, right? And, and those components are a variety of complexities uh, that Corey Kerr goes really well, uh, visually goes through um, and it's very inspiring where he'll show, you know, like something like a feathering technique and an image. And instead of going, oh, I'm just gonna draw the exact image that this guy did or draw in their style. What he goes is, I just wanna use feathering. What is it about the feathering on this? That's where like your line kind of tapers to a point and you use multiple amounts of those lines, usually in a way that shows also the form but also indicates um, from the thin point, a lighter version of shade, and from the thickest point, a darker version of the shade. We've all seen it, it's like the Charles Burns technique of inking. So you can 
like try to just look like Charles Burns, or you can look at Charles Burns, at which which is the lower level execution, or you can look at Charles Burns, dissect his work, and go, what is it about Charles Burns that's speaking to me? For me, as an artist, I look at him and I'm like, it's the feathering of the brush. It's that taper from thick to thin that is being used to indicate the form of the item or the subject, as well as the value, like the light to dark in the image. So when I look at that, then I can now try to, to mimic feathering. And I don't have to have my feathering look like Charles Burns. Um, but if I use feathering to express, like language, the ideas that visually feathering can express, then suddenly you're going to end up with work that's using a tool to generate and, and communicate an idea um, in the way that that tool is able to do, right? Like the thick to thin to show value, the th um, thick to thin to show form, like the, the curve of the, of the line or the feathered line. How that's moving, how that's uh, angled on a form can show dimensionality to it. So anyhow, it's just something to think about. Um, start thinking. I, at least I think it's very valuable to start thinking about the packages you're seeing visually in art and exploding the packages and looking at the components that are within the package and start analyzing those components for, can I glean something from this? Can I take a little idea here? Can I take like five of these from this guy and four of them from this guy and or girl or whatever or five of these ideas from this writer or four of these basic things that are structuring an argument or four of these basic things that are structuring a marketing campaign which by the way the components of that are very similar to the components of like thesis supporting facts conclusion right and then the who what when where and why of a story <laughs> these are all interconnected ideas and I have no idea if this is coherent. I hope it is. But that's what I've been thinking about this morning. I, uh, that's going to do it for my vloggings. I'm Joshua Kimball. I make graphic novels. You can check out those graphic novels at joshuakimball.com or just go direct to your bookstore and pick up Jacob's Apartment or Two Stories, two graphic novels that I built from the ground up. And uh, I drew, illustrated, and, you know, um, in, in the case of two stories, it's hand lettered, hand inked. It's, it's all traditionally done and it tries to destigmatize conversations of mental illness. And then Jacob's Apartment is like a slice of life indie book that, you know, talks about uh, first love, um, about the meaning of faith, and explores the uh, complicated relationship uh, between a, a two roommates that are polar opposites, but because of life circumstances, find themselves drawn together. Uh, based on uh, a, a search for a meaning as well as, you know, um, being confronted with death and loss um, at a young age. So it deals with some heavy concepts, but it, it but again, kind of takes the package and breaks it down um, really simply. And if you want to support my channel, um, that's a really good way to do it. Other than that, hit subscribe, hit the bell. Hey, you lazy person, hit that like button. Don't, don't wait. You, right there, the one who's like just casually listening and you're like, I enjoy this content, I listen to it all the time, but I don't have to hit the like button. No, you do. Do it. Do it. You can do it right there. I'll give you two seconds before this video ends. We're going to wait. Okay, hit the like button. Good job. Okay, that's it. Um, I appreciate you guys and I will talk to you on my next vloggins like Kenny Loggins but with a vlog so it's Kenny Vloggins all right anyhow Joshua Kemble vlog uh oh and hit subscribe bell so you get notifications when I'm about to go live I do a lot of live streams and that'll do it uh let me know what you think did this make any sense am I crazy all right I'll talk to you guys later